Bing, bing, boom. It's mind pump time. All right. Uh, in today's episode, uh, we talk about three important things to get you super duper fit. By the way, we're going to do a giveaway with today's uh, program here because that's what we do on every single episode. We give things away. I know I've said we're giving, but I don't need to say that anymore. I think you've already figured that out for yourself. Today's free giveaway is MAPS Anabolic. So you're going to get a free MAPS Anabolic program. If you do the following, leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you by commenting underneath and you'll get free access. By the way, that also means you have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. You know what's super annoying? When we notify someone, but they don't turn on notifications, so they don't see the notification, so they didn't win anything. That's super annoying. Do those things. Subscribe, turn on your notifications. Also, uh, this episode is sponsored by one of our sponsored LMNT. Go check them out. It's a great uh, company. Normally, I don't mention sponsors that way on our YouTube channel, but it's one of our favorite companies to uh, to work with. Head over to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. Get yourself a free sample pack. Uh, and I don't think there's a code with that. I think it's just drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. One more thing. We are running a sale all month long. Uh, two programs on sale. Very good for building muscle. Map Strong, Maps Powerlift. Very popular programs. Both 50% off. Go check them out. Mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for that discount. All right. Enjoy the show. Off topic, and I know this isn't the, the conversation we're having today, but I did want to bring up, I actually got a lot of DMs about your comment, um, which I haven't done yet, mm. about combining the uh, sodium, the L the LMNT with creatine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got messages about that, like, oh, my God, Sal said this the other day. So oh, I haven't yeah. done that yet. Yeah, so mm. it increases the uptake of creatine. So there's a couple ways you People can were make- saying they like feel the difference. Big time. Wow, yeah. Big interesting. Time. So there's a couple ways you can increase the intake of creatine, uh, carbohydrates Build or sugars. cell volume. Is one of them. Sodium is the other one. And, of course, sodium has no calories. And before your workout, it helps with the pump. So anyway. sugar I was always aware of because of cell tech. Yeah. yeah. That was their their theory was that they pumped- But I don't want to drink- 70 just- grams of sugar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who wants to do that? No, no, that makes sense. And that was why they used to tell you to- mix it with like grape juice or whatever like yep. that, right? That was yep. like kind of the, the No, formula. sodium. Sodium works excellent. Yeah, wow. So I, I do it in the LMNT. And right you you just, do you put it like in a water bottle size amount? Because normally I actually, the LMNT is so strong that I actually put it in my big No, jug. so I'll fill this up right here, right? And yeah. I'll, it's like a shaker cup and I'll, th- this will be filled with water, yeah. element. Tea, I'll work out with it. Yeah. Then I'll do another one post-workout okay. and then add, uh, add the creatine. Okay. So I do the creatine. Okay. Post workout. Speaking yeah, of workouts. Speaking of workouts. I knew you were speaking do that. of workouts, we again, uh, you know, we'll we'll cut up our shows into clips, put it on YouTube, and occasionally certain clips get lots of comments, lots of questions, lots of people interested. And one of the more recent ones that had a lot of interest really revolved around uh, information surrounding basics of workout programming, in particular, sets, reps. Rest periods in particular, like, mm-hmm. like, you know, everything about those things. Why are they important? What do they do? And, um, you know, I, again, sometimes we get stuck in the minutia, especially because we've been doing this for so long that if you think about all the important things to communicate, like those three things, just those three things right there are so important. It makes such an Im- impact on how well you're going to respond to your workout. Well, well really you, you, no- yeah, you see all these different modalities kind of be like become uh, created as, as a result of manipulating those factors. Right? Yeah. And people get really uh, almost religious and, and they evangelize that this is the, the best way, the, the best rep range, the best tempo, the best mm-hmm. rest uh, amount of time that you're going to uh, have in your workouts. And so it becomes like this sort of uh, fight amongst people in, in fitness. It's hilarious. Well, it's really the nuts and bolts of exercise programming yep. i mean minus the uh exercise selection which would be up there with uh, the most important things when it comes to programming so other than that these are the the other factors that make all yeah. the difference of what 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 constitutes a good or bad program i would say yeah, no, yeah. I mean, and to give you an example i, I, I want to illustrate this with an example that has nothing to do with working out so let's say i gave somebody 10 colors uh that they could use to paint a picture Depending on how you use the colors, the strokes that you make, and the way you combine them, you'll either have something that's recognizable as a painting, or you'll just have a bunch of random colors on a piece of canvas. This is what workout programming is. So when you look at workout programming, you have all these different pieces, and just throwing them on the canvas doesn't give you an effective workout. There is a way you put them together 
there's an order that you can put them together that'll make it super effective or not effective at all. So mm -hmm. programming is extremely important when it comes to, and that's what program, that's what we're referring to, is how you put it together, how it all works together in the week, in the month, and so on. Uh, that determines your progress uh, or not. I feel so, like that's the first time you've used that art analogy for, for programming. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the very first time. Well, I'm yeah. just picturing like, you know, like really shitty art that people think is uh, amazing. Yeah. Like that, so yeah. very I, I good. thought you were going to go it's, with the build a cake uh, analogy. Not a bad analogy, right? though, because yeah. there's a lot of times where people think that yeah. something is really good and it's really yeah. not. It's really trash because yeah. it's just a bunch of random stuff well, thrown together yeah, for no Yeah, because you see salt, sugar, you, you know, eggs and flour, and you see how people all put that together. Like and you can get a really shitty cake. You know that's that's also a, a good point to make too, though, is that you know there's um, there's exercising and then there's training, right? And exercise can be anything. Like just you, moving. It, yeah, just moving and and there's there's benefits to exercise and it's not a bad thing. Uh, I think where we get really hypercritical about programming is a lot of programs out there are just a bunch of exercises mm -hmm. and they're not de they're not designed like a training program that is designed to take you somewhere mm -hmm. you know get you faster get you stronger reduce body fat build muscle a lot of them really are just a bunch of exercises that are thrown together in a creative manner and there is a significant difference between somebody who wants to exercise and somebody who wants to train now our profession is trainers is we get clients that have goals, that have a place they want to get, and therefore this stuff really matters. It does. And also consider this, when you're looking at workout programs, typically workout programs designed for the general population whose goal is just to lose weight, they place almost no energy or emphasis on workout programming. Because yeah. you take the average person who's not active and you just get them to move more and eat less – and they will lose weight. Now, of course, they end up failing later on. I think the fail rate is something like 90%. Yeah. Now, contrast that to workout programs that are designed for athletes, especially competitive strength athletes. Lots of thought, lots of effort goes into the programming because the result has to be you perform better mm -hmm. on stage when you're lifting a weight or you're cleaning something you know, overhead. So the workout programming in the for general, for fitness, for leanness, for whatever, typically sucks. And this is yeah. one of the reasons why one of the main things that we do is we design programs. We saw that and we said, okay, this is wide open for like really good workout well, programs. To your earlier point, that that's that's the argument that I always I can't stand that argument. The one that's like, well, they're at least doing something now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you know, beforehand they weren't even uh, getting off the couch and and making the effort, and so at least they're doing this. But if if you kind of play that all the way out and, and see what that ends up doing in terms of like creating bad habits mm -hmm. and, and creating problems in the future, they could have avoided by just uh, being more intentional and in, in finding their way towards a better program. Uh, they would have had a lot better success. All right, so let's start with set. Sets, right. Uh, first, let's describe what a set is for people who might not know what that is. So a set is a, a, a specified period of time that you're doing the exercise uh, consistently. So let's say you're doing 10 times of an exercise or reps, which we'll get to, and then you stop. That was a set. And sets refers to repeating that over and over again or doing different sets of different exercises. Now, why is that important? It's important because uh, defining sets helps you define reps. It helps you define the length of time that you're doing the exercise. Volume. Volume. And sets are very important. Like, why not just do one set? Like, why do I have to do sets of anything? Well, anecdotally, for decades, athletes and bodybuilders and strength athletes noticed that they just, they just got better results when they did multiple sets versus just one. We now have studies that support this entirely. They'll compare single set to three sets or four sets. And typically, generally speaking, multiple sets performs better than just one uh, particular set. Now, there's always, a, of course, there's a diminishing returns point where you can do too many and then you're not getting great results. But s doing multiple sets generally is better than just doing well, one. Well, let's talk about that. Do you think uh, when programming, uh, choosing an exercise, we're going to choose bench press, we're going to choose squat, whatever the exercise we're going to do. Is there a sweet spot of how many sets that you do? Is there a number that's not enough? And is there a number that is too much? And is there a sweet spot there? Do you yeah. So studies will show that the range for total sets per body part, and I'm going to explain why there's a range here. Generally is about, for, for most people, that the sweet spot is nine to something like 18 sets 
total per week. So if you did three workouts, divide it up by those three workouts uh, for that body part. Now, why is there such a range? That's like 9 to 18, right? That's uh, it's double within that particular range. Because some exercises cause more damage to the body than others, right? 18 sets of barbell squats can feel very different Oof. than 18 sets well, also of leg think, extensions. I also think there's a, 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 that wide of a, a, a variance, too, is because of the genetic potential of the person, the client. The fitness I mean, level. Yeah, yeah, the fitness level. Like totally. Some people... Uh, respond really well to lots of sets, high volume, which would be on the 18, 20, 20 yeah. sets in a week type of range. Other people respond really well to a lower amount, which would be the nine set. And think about that for a second. Nine is not very many for an entire week. No, it's three mm -hmm. sets three times a week, right? Per body part. Right. So that's not all. And and finding, and I also, uh, I also think for the person that is just getting started, regardless if you do well on more sets, almost everybody should start on the low end and then scale up. Oh, of course. Yeah. There's an upper limit of what you can tolerate, and then there's a sweet spot in terms of what's going to give you the best results, and they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Okay? So let's say my – I'll give you an example. Let's say my body, it just responds the best. It's the healthiest. I build the most strength, the most muscle. I get the best consistent results. At 12 sets uh, per body part per week, but I can tolerate and get away with doing 20 sets. That doesn't make it better. That mm -hmm. just means I can tolerate it. In fact, I'll probably get worse results at 20 than I did at 12. And this is important because what we tend to do, especially as fitness fanatics, is we tend to push to what we can tolerate, yeah. not aim for what is ideal. Well, yeah, but then we just get into that trap of of you know I'm, I I can tolerate it, but really am I adapting? You know, versus yeah. uh, which adapting is really that that's the sweet spot. You try and find that like really uh, advantageous dose where your body's going to respond, get stronger, build muscle, and it's not just you know trying to weather the storm and go through the gauntlet. Which the irony of it is like so in the beginning you you know you can't tolerate as many sets and so you kind of work your way up in terms of like the dose with that but two uh the goal isn't to be able to do as many sets as possible yeah. and like the the most crazy volume you can because the goal is the opposite it's the opposite the goal the goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change so even if you are someone like sal who can handle 20 plus sets on a sing on a single uh you know muscle group in a week if he hasn't been training for, let's say, a month, uh, just because he can tolerate that, going anywhere near that doesn't make sense. No. Starting someone off who hasn't been trained, starting them off in the nine range for the week it, on the lower end of the of the spectrum would be a much better place, even if you're somebody who handles yeah. that high volume, because you again you want to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. Yeah, so it's like it's like imagine you're getting a, like a dirty dish and you're washing it, and in about a minute it's perfectly clean, right? But you're like, I'm gonna wash this for five more minutes, right? <laughs> you're, you're you're wasting your fun. time. Yeah, you're totally wasting. It ain't gonna get any cleaner. Is is the point? Now it's an even that's not even a good example because. Because it would be more like this. If I went for five minutes washing the dish, it's going to start to get dirty again. This is what happens to your body. Mm. You go past a certain point. Now you're taking away from your body's ability uh, to adapt. Here's one of the greatest discussions that I like to have around sets. And I learned this uh, uh, relatively young. So when I first started working out, my first experience with you know programming was I, I had Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. In fact, that we actually have it up here in the studio. It's all covered in in tape because I've read that thing probably a million times. Got it when I was, I think for my 14th birthday. And Arnold loved to do or liked to promote lots of exercises, maybe three sets per exercise, right? So let's say you're doing 15 sets for chest. It was probably comprised of five exercises, uh, three sets each. And so I did that for a little while. Now, later on, I got my hands on different style of training. And I, I believe, and I know it's called German volume training. I don't know what it was called back then. I think that might've been what it was called. Yeah, GVT, the but, 10 sets. Yeah, but they, they recommended, rather than doing 15 sets of, you know, total three sets of five exercises, right? They would say something like uh, two exercises, divide 15 sets, or do one exercise and just do 15 sets. You're doing lots of sets of one exercise versus fewer sets of lots of exercises. And I tried that, right? I did a whole block. I think it was like a, a two-month period of training where I cut my exercises way down and I just did more sets of fewer exercises. And I got phenomenal results. I got incredibly strong and I got great results. Now, that doesn't mean that that was better. 
uh, because it was a change. That's what got my body to respond because, of course, then when I went back to the old way, I got a great response again. <laughs> but it highlights that there's a difference between the two, right? The fewer uh, sets, more exercises was good for the pump, good for different angles, you know, different stimulus. The fewer exercises, more sets. Boy, I practiced these exercises a lot. My CNS got lots of training in a particular movement pattern, and I got really, really strong. Both extremely valuable, both uh, things I think you should mess around with. And if, in fact, if you follow our MAPS programs, you'll see this. Some of our programs have way more sets with less exercises, and other uh, programs will have you know, fewer sets per exercise, but more exercise. We get asked a lot about what we think about GVT training, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's excellent. You know, it's a, the unfortunate part is a similar knock that we get with somebody who's never seen any of our programming and they buy anabolic for the first time is the, the simplicity of yeah. it. Oh, it they, seems too simple. Yeah. Oh, that's it. You're, just, those are, you're only doing that many exercises? Like, that can't, and then people, people assume it's not as good because it doesn't have a bunch of creative exercise. But the truth is, and we talk about this, you, especially you, Sal, all the time about the importance of practicing movements, mm -hmm. especially the big ones, especially yeah. the ones that are more technical, like the squatting, the dead, the deadlifting, the overhead pressing. These movements are so technical. I've been doing them for 20 years, and I still don't think I've perfected those movements, mm -hmm. and I'm still making tweaks on improving them. So even with all the experience that we have in there, there's so much room to improve, and you get so many benefits from improving in those movements that it makes sense to do something 10 sets like that. And it seems like mundane because you're like oh i'm gonna come in and all i'm gonna do is what two exercises today and yeah. that's all i'm gonna mm -hmm. train but i actually love to do this and i i like to sprinkle it in i don't know once a quarter when i mm -hmm. haven't trained like this in a while that's one of the ways i'll break up our programming because we don't have a lot i don't think we have anything that is 10 or 15 sets of one, For one exercise. exercise yeah no, no. no but it's a great it's a great way to train I, I love training this way and i love teaching clients this because sometimes two to three or four sets is not enough for somebody who you're trying to teach like a squat to. It's like the first one, they're all over the place. The second one, you finally get them the concept to do it. The third yeah. one, they're finally, it, they're on, yeah. and now it's time to move on. It's like, no, let's, let's stay here for a while. They haven't gotten the groove yet, yes. which is, you know, one of those things. It's it, You feel that when you, when everything sort of uh, clicks and, and uh, your body responds the way it wants to and it stabilizes you properly through all that. So there's lots of little nuances, especially in those compound exercises uh, where I've, I find lots of value with practicing it repeatedly. Oh, yeah, I noticed when I do, if I did like 10 sets of, let's say, deadlifts or squats, by set four or five, I actually start to get stronger. <clears throat> it looks like, it's almost like I start off at a certain strength, I'll get stronger halfway through all those sets, and then I start to get a little fatigued. It's a very interesting feeling. Now, on the flip side, less sets per exercise, but more exercises, this is like what you'll get when you do your bodybuilding style workout. A really good pump and a good squeeze, and you're hitting mm. different angles of the body part. So, you know, there's, there's value to that as well. Now there's more. There's there are also advanced types of set uh, configurations. One of them being a superset. Mm -hmm. A superset really is two exercises put together without any rest. So it, it counts as one big set. There's a lot of different ways to do this. You could do the same body part. So you know squats to lunges, for example, or you could do opposing body parts. So bicep to tricep. You can also do different body parts that aren't too close to each other. This, I don't necessarily count as a, as a superset. I don't see tons of value in this. There's some value, but not a ton. I like to focus on either the same body part or opposing body parts uh, within you know this kind of superset. So it's two exercises back to back. You could do a compound to an isolation or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mess around with this. Really, really good for the pump. It's good for stamina and endurance. I like to use this personally when I'm cutting my calories and I know my strength is going down anyway. So it just gets me out of that mindset of, oh my gosh, I'm getting well, weaker. I have to go lighter anyway. And this also sort of blends into another one of the acute variables with rest. So you're going to cut that rest in between, you know, jumping from this exercise to yep. the next one. And it gives you that uh, a completely different kind of a, a, a feel and a stimu it stimulates the muscles completely differently. Yeah. Now, I feel like one of the important takeaways from this is that one, you there is a sweet spot, so that nine to mm -hmm. uh, twenty sets in a week for a body part, right, is kind of where you want to be. I think that's, I think we should give people an idea of what the do's and don'ts here, right? So I, I want to fall somewhere in there. There's there's yeah. your sweet spot. Whatever whatever I decide, if I'm going to do in, incorporate drop sets or supersets or these different types of training modalities or ways of training, I want to do that for three to four weeks, stay consistent with that so I can then see the response that my body is getting from it and then 
move or change from that to a different style right i like that by the way drop set is when you'll do a set with a particular weight without rest take some weight off and then do another set right away and you could do this three or four times very advanced the drop sets pyramids there's a there's a lot of different styles this way and i think i think for someone who's learning how to program them the, there's, you know, the first way to do that is to stick with that. Yeah, for, stick for, with the basics. Yeah, there. stick with that for a while, and then you can start to play with mm -hmm. all these different uh, techniques in there. And the one thing, that, the one pitfall that I think I see that's most common is just uh, falling in love with one, and then that, uh, then a, a, adopting that as like the way you train always. Yeah. So that's the thing you got to. I caution everybody that's listening is like, oh, okay, so I've never tried that before. The guys talked about GVT training. I'm gonna go do a bench press for. 10 sets on my next workout and squats yeah. 10 sets and that's all i'm gonna do and they say great results oh my god the body responds yeah, like your experience forever. yeah and now you're stuck now you're doing that for the next six months to a year because you got such great results in that first month and the same rules apply that we always talk about you know one of the best things you could ever do for yourself is what it whatever it is you're not doing right now so then you move out of that and you and you adopt other ways to to stack your sets totally now let's talk about reps right so a rep is literally one full completion of an exercise in other words if i'm doing a squat going down coming all the way up that's one rep doing a curl curling the weight up bringing it up back down that's a repetition. Uh, now, of course, reps are important because that's what gets the muscle to move with resistance, and that's what sends the muscle building uh, stimulus. Now, one of the bigger debates in fitness for a long time, this is actually one of the debates that have been around for a long time, probably since the beginning, not so much today because we have lots of studies around it, but definitely I remember when I was a kid, this was a big debate, was What's the best rep range, right? Oh, yeah. How many reps builds the most muscle? How many reps burns the most body fat, right? You know, if I'm a strength athlete, what do I train in? If I'm a bodybuilder, what do I train in? And it was always this debate back and forth in terms of what's the best rep range. Now, I think it's safe to say that, especially if you look at the studies, anywhere between maybe one rep to 30 reps, I would say, in, in the context of resistance training, in other words, lifting weights or using resistance in a way to build muscle, you're, you're fine. One to 30, there's value in all those. Once you go over 30, it starts to become more cardio-like, and obviously, you can't go below one rep. So they all have some value. Now, which one builds the most muscle, right? Here's where the studies get confusing. Mm. If you read studies, and studies are typically done nine weeks or 12 weeks long at the most, when they compare groups of people, what they tend to find in these studies, they tend to because some are conflicting, they tend to find that 8 to 12 reps builds the most muscle uh, in people. Now, here's the problem with that is they're short studies, and they're not showing that a person adapts to a particular rep range, and then what do you do from there, right? 8 to 12 definitely will in a head-to-head, -head, but if you keep going down that path long enough and you never get out of 8 to 12 reps – your body will stop responding. And what will get your body to continue responding is to go to a different rep range, 3 to 5 or 15 uh, to 20. Here's the truth about the rep ranges, like I said, 1 to 30. They all build muscle. This right. is what's cool they about them. They all build muscle. They all burn body fat. All of them. <laughs> and they all burn body fat. Forget the calories burned while doing your workout. This is such a dumb thing that people look at. Mm -hmm. How many calories did I burn while I did my workout? It's such a nominal number that means almost nothing when you consider the context of your metabolism. Which one, what rep range is going to affect my metabolism in a way that makes my metabolism burn the most calories? Well, that's the rep range that's going to build the most muscle. So then the question is, which rep range builds the most muscle? Muscle, the one that you're probably not used to. You know, right. Getting the rep range you're not used to. Um, and that's where you're going to see, you know, this is hard. I, this is probably one of the hardest hurdles to get people to understand because of all the camps that we have in yeah. fitness. Uh, you, you alluded to it already. We have the, you know, bodybuilding camp. You have the, you know, strong, strong man camp, power, power lifter yep. camp, you, you know, endurance, the Spartan. I mean, you have all these camps and then there's studies and research around what, you know, rep range or sets, whatever we're talking about is uh, most ideal for that, that client. And then it's, well, whatever I identify with. So that's how I train all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I fell into this trap. I fell into this trap as a, as a young kid thinking that if I wanted to build muscle, I got to stay in the six rep range and I never moved out of it forever. Then I got stuck in the, the bodybuilding mentality. Oh, I want to sculpt and build a body. They say hypertrophy, eight to 12 reps is the best range to stay in. And so then I stayed in that yeah. range forever. But the truth is, just like I was talking about with the sets, 
whatever rep range you decide you want to be in for whatever goals, stay in that for three to six weeks and then move out of it regardless of what the goal is. And the idea is to, to move through all those different rep ranges so the body is constantly having to adapt and change. Yeah, yeah and one of the, the main things, or one of the things I saw a lot too with like female clients coming in was just um, you know, the exposure towards the lower rep range was something that, uh, you know, I, I know based off of a lot of marketing out there, a lot of programs that, uh, you know, uh, people have subscribed to in the past or, or let's say like, um, you know, a lot of the videos that, that were like being pushed out there were very high in the rep range because you wanted to keep those lean tone muscles. And so this yeah. was something that was very much marketed to uh, forever, which, uh, you know, then taking a female client and then putting them through like, you know, anywhere from like one to five reps uh, was like a totally different experience. And, and their body just responded right away because it was just something they had never even considered doing. Oh, well, this, this was one of the, the greatest selling points for me personally for this all happening. I mean, almost eight years ago now, Sal sent me over MAPS Anabolic and the, the what him and Doug had created. And in, at that point in my career, this was something that I had figured out by now that, man, one of my favorite things to do to a female client was make them train in a strength phase. Once I got past the mental hurdle that this is not going to make you bulky and, and huge, that this is the best thing for your body, their bodies responded so well for that exact reason that you're saying. So the idea of coming out with a program where you started everybody in a strength phase, I just thought was brilliant. Figure, you figure 65 to 80% of most trainers' clients are females. That's one of the biggest hurdles that you have to come over is convincing them to strength train. So I know that, okay, one of the easiest ways I can start to show my client great results results immediately is by probably putting them in a phase they've never trained in. And that was one of the brilliant things that I saw in MAPS and a ball. I said, oh my God, this is so, yeah. such the right way to start 90% of your clients. Yeah. I had a lot of, uh, I, I mean, countless female clients. I, I can't seem to tone my legs or I can't seem to tone my arms. And then I would put them in low reps. What, why are we doing low reps? Well, watch what happens. They come to me afterwards and Oh my gosh! I've never been this toned. What's happening? Like you're building. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's, yeah. that's what's that, happening. That means build muscle. Yeah, and you and you've never lifted you know heavy before. The opposite is true too. Like so, uh, my my guys who never want my guys that want to get big and strong, yeah. never wanted to do higher. Definitely would never do twenties. Exactly. Yeah. And what that's why I love you know Stan Efforting is is known for this uh, and at least on social media he's he's one of those guys that touts twenty rep squats. You yeah, know, because he never did them before. Yeah, nobody does that. You know. What I'm saying but he's he's strong as an ox and i tell you right now if you've never trained 20 set 20 sets of freaking or 20, 20 reps. reps excuse me 20 reps of squats watch how your legs respond oh, they yeah. will blow up from that but it, there's this idea that oh well that's for leaning out or yeah. that's for girls to lift that many repetitions so this idea of a rep range fits this demographic of people is so silly and the truth is most people never train in that rep range and there's still tremendous benefits in that high rep range yeah. for building strength and muscle. Yeah. And if you've never done it, watch what happens. Yeah. One of the most important things I think to understand about rep ranges isn't necessarily what the rep ranges do for your body and how, you know, and high reps versus low reps. And that's, that's valuable, but here's the most valuable thing is the mindset mm -hmm. that you go into when you're training higher reps versus lower reps. It's very different, right? So if I'm going in to do a set of squats for five repetitions, it's a different mindset than when I'm going to do a set of squats for 20 reps, right? When I'm doing five reps, obviously the weight is going to be much, much, much heavier. I'm bracing. I'm holding my breath at the bottom of the squat. It's all about driving with my CNS and hyping myself up and staying tight and very, very different feeling. When I go to do 20 reps, I'm controlling my breathing. I'm trying to get a good pump. I'm squeezing at the top. Uh, the burn is totally different. It's a totally different feeling. And so it requires a different mindset. Well, this is where I think tempo pay, plays such a huge factor oh, with yeah. reps. Mm -hmm. Is when you're doing something, you're like you said, lifting really heavy. It's it tends to be a faster, more explosive type of tempo because you've got to m move that weight. When you're going for something that's more of a pump, it's the slower, more controlled type of tempo where you're trying to feel the exercise and slow it down. And the 
slower, the more time under the tension, the more blood you're going to pump into the muscle. And so it, it lends itself well. So this is where you start to see all the different 422, the 111, and like, what yeah, are all these? Explain that. What, is the, what do those numbers mean? What does 422 mean, right? So four would be the negative or eccentric portion of the exercise. Two would be the isometric contraction, which is the part where you hold it either at the bottom of a bench press, the bottom of a squat. And then the one to two seconds would then be on the positive, right? So the four would be four motion. seconds down two seconds at the bottom, two seconds up. Right. So whenever you see any kind of workout I mean, first you have to understand, if ever, for in, every, in every rep, there are three portions of that exercise, yes. right? Concentric, mm -hmm. eccentric, and isometric, right? So basically, the positive is what everybody would know it, know it the negative, and then the you know the hold, right, of the, of the portion of the exercise. And, and all three of those, they hold tremendous value. Yes. And all three of those, I would say, you put more specific emphasis on the portion of that based off of what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Oh, you can manipulate all three. Like one of my favorite things to do, for example, uh, I like to do this with squats, is I'll manipulate the hold. So I'll get into a squat and I'll do a four second negative and then I'll hold the bottom for four seconds or five seconds and mm -hmm. then I'll come up. For example, and that's yep. if I want to work on the bottom portion of my squat and increase the stability there. You can manipulate all three of those, by the way, in a particular rep and make the exercise feel oh, completely yeah. different. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's why with beginners, I like to make sure like the tempo is like a 4 2, two or something that's nice and slow. And, and you're really emphasizing each one of those uh, contractions because, uh, you know, it's all about control, stability. It's about like organizing your body to get through the mechanics of it. Uh, and so, you know, the intention of it is everything going into the exercise in order to learn it properly and get your body to respond properly. But then you can start having fun with it and, you know, like it, cut out like part of the, the timing for concentric. And so now all of a sudden I'm more explosive in that rep and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the opposite of that, where I'm just like, you know, really grinding through the negative, which really breaks down the muscle in a different way. And so, you know, you can have a lot of fun by just manipulating each one of those. This was one of my favorite things to teach it still is uh because i would of all the things we're talking about today i would say it's the one that's least manipulated or played with oh yeah everybody's uh, the same tempo i mean even reason. doug was bringing i mean when we were talking about this episode and we were putting together he goes you know i really want you guys to get into tempo he goes i even as much knowledge as he has and and being around us and all experience he's got uh, it's that's still something that hasn't fully registered for him how he plays with it and there's a reason for this because one it's not talked about very often and there are these tempos that that are are attached to these avatars or types of training modalities right so i'm a power lifter it's explosive it's yeah. you know quick and fast like olympic lifting power lifting is that way i'm a bodybuilder it's slow and controlled and feel the squeeze yeah. and, so, and so you Maintain have the, that muscle tension yeah, the whole so you, time you have these 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 avatars or characters that we identify with and we see that's the way they train and so we just fall right into that whatever feel and then once you do that for a, a long enough period of time your body gets good at that tempo Tempo. And so you want to be good at all your exercises. I want to be good at my squat. I want to yeah. be good at my bench press. So you don't manipulate that. You know, this is the, and a lot of times people aren't even doing the most ideal one for what they're trying to accomplish. Like there's research around mm -hmm. what the hypertrophy ideal tempo is for, and it's that four, two, two. I always tell people that so I always one of my favorite things to manipulate because a lot of people want to build muscle and burn body fat and train for hypertrophy. And I go in and I go like, okay, let's see if you actually do a four two two. And very few people nobody does a four second negative. No, right. you you never see it. And if you'd never train that way, one, it's going to be a lot harder. So you're going to have to reduce the weight, which is tough for a lot of the people with the ego that want to lift the weight they were lifting. But talk about a, a quick, easy way to get your body to change because you've gotten so used to training in this one specific tempo. Yeah. And now there's there's some basic you know, uh, rules to the different types of tempos for what you're trying to accomplish. But again, it's just like the other thing we were talking about with sets and reps is, or at sets is that whatever it is that you're, you were consistently doing, one of the best things you can do is do something different. Yeah. yeah. So if you're the power lifter, explosive guy, who's doing a one, one, one all the time type of tempo, mm -hmm. one of the best things that guy can do is go do a bodybuilding and the same, the reverse is true for the, the guy who does the right, bodybuilding. Now he's more connected to his muscles. He, you know, there's just so much, 
carry over and benefit for both. Like even if you're a bodybuilder, like that, that avoids uh, a lot of that, like heavy, you know, loading in one to five rep range. Well, you're missing out on, on stretching the capacity even further for recruiting more muscle fibers. Yes. So, you know, there, there's just a lot of carryover between each one of these types of uh, ways of manipulating the tempo. Yeah. By the way, that, that middle number where there's that pause typically refers to the bottom of a repetition. Although you can do an isometric portion of a rep at any portion of a repetition, the top halfway through, there's lots of different mm -hmm. ways to manipulate a rep to work different, uh, you know, different areas of the rep. And then that of course will train different. Parts. And I love to manipulate that part when I have a client who has a really hard time connecting to a muscle, mm -hmm. right? So you alluded to the squat and holding on there. Love that for somebody who can't feel it in their glutes. Mm -hmm. Every time they squat, all I feel in my quad is we'll, I'll get them down in that isometric position and then try and get them to think about driving through their glutes and focusing on that. So I extend that period of time and that's great for getting them to feel that. And then there's also benefits to it because they never train that way. They're probably going to build more muscle because of that. Totally. Um, you also look at your rep form and uh, compare perfect reps to loose reps. Now, typically, uh, you're going to get more value out of really good, perfect reps. However, there is some value in loose reps. Uh, there is. Now, I'll save that for advanced lifters. Like, you see an advanced lifter doing something like a push press or a cheek curl. Is there value in that? Some. There is some value. But for most people, you want your repetitions to look very, very clean, very perfect. Just generally speaking, you'll get better results that way. There's also things like forced reps. This is where you have a partner help you squeeze out more reps after you can't do any more repetitions. There's partial reps where you can't do the same amount of weight for five more reps because it's too heavy now. So you do five half reps. That's par partial reps. Those are all advanced techniques. And I'm going to be quite honest. There's a little bit of value uh, that you can find in advanced lifters occasionally. But for most people, if you avoid those, you're fine. Mm. Not only are you fine, you're probably better off. I, I think for most people incorporating things like forced reps and partial reps and going to failure will probably get you to your goals slower. Well, the thing you got to be faster. careful is the same thing that I brought up before is let's say someone's listening right now and they're like, oh, I've never tried loose reps or partial reps. And then they start or going to failure and then they start to add that to their routine and Whoa, the body responds. Well, yeah, it responds because you weren't trained. You never trained this way, and now you've had it. The thing you got to be careful then is falling in love with that now. Oh, I always do these types of partial reps or forced reps or going to failure because my body responded that one time when I did it. And that's, you got to just be careful of any of these techniques that you're using, any of these rep ranges, any of these sets that you're sticking to. You want to stick to it for an, a, an extended period of time where you can actually track and see how the body's responding. We, we, tend to say somewhere between that three to six week range and then move away from it. Yeah. So whatever you're messing with in the rep range, the same thing go holds true here. If I'm going to follow this 12 rep range, tempo looks like this, I'm going to do that for a good three to four weeks. After that, then I'm going to move out of that to keep my body progressing. Now, I will say though, partial reps, forced reps, going to failure, for most people, you're yeah. probably better off it, avoiding Those them. are advanced techniques. Yeah, and, yeah, and no. just not because, you know, and it's not because they're advanced and you're just not good enough to do them. It's just too much. It'll get your yeah. body. You're, you will not progress faster. If anything, you might slow your progress uh, down. The last one is rest periods. And what's funny is for the average person, this is the most controversial. And it's the most controversial because this is what you tend to hear from people whenever you tell them to rest in between sets. I used to get this with clients all the time. Well, why do I need to not do anything? Can't yeah, I right. do something while I'm sitting here? As if the rest <laughs> period is a waste of time. Right. Or as if I have to rest. Here's another one. Clients would tell me. I can keep going. I don't need to rest. No, no, no. You're not resting because you have to. <laughs> yeah. You're resting because the rest is as important as the active part of the workout, which is the reps and the sets. Now, why is that so important? Well, here's why. When you're doing resistance training, you should be, your goal should be to try to build muscle, speed up the metabolism. Of course, the side effect of that is to become leaner, essentially make your body more bulletproof and make it easier for you to stay lean. And of course, when you build muscle, you look better better hormones, that whole deal. Well, why do we have to rest? If we don't rest, we start to move into a, an energy system. In other words, your body starts to use energy that actually does not encourage muscle building, but rather encourages endurance, stamina, which is fine if that's what you're looking for. But if you always train for endurance, you'll actually teach your body to lose muscle because it becomes advantageous for your body to burn less calories, become more efficient, and you don't need strength Mm -hmm. to have lots of endurance. The evidence is in endurance athletes. Look at endurance athletes. They're very small. 
little body fat, little muscle as well. Uh, in, in fact, very, very little muscle on most endurance uh, athletes. Resting means when you rest that you're burning a type of energy. And there's a type of energy system uh, primarily driven by something called ATP. And we don't need to get all complicated with it. But it's a very quick burning, explosive form of energy. But it also burns out very quickly. So if you do a set of, let's say, 12 repetitions, that's the energy that you're using. Then you rest, allow it to replenish, and then use it again. Utilizing that form of energy encourages muscle building. If I don't rest and I just do set after set after set after set, I'll burn that energy out and then I'll type tap into something called glycogen. Now I'm just training for endurance. That's fine if you want to do that, but if you're doing set after set after set with little to no rest, you're essentially doing cardio with weights. Well, like like the sets and reps, um there there is a spectrum here, but there is still a range, right? Yes. And and moving out of that range on either end of the spectrum is not ideal. And it's going to fall somewhere between 30 seconds on the low end up to three minutes on, on the high end. Yes. And everything in between there has value mm -hmm. to all pursuits, right? Mm -hmm. Building muscle, building strength, building stamina, and all those things are all these, all those rest periods contribute to those goals. And the same, if you haven't picked up on this theme yet, it's the same rules apply as the other ones, whichever way you've been training all the time, the one that you never do or rarely do is probably one of the most ideal for whatever your pursuit is, yeah. whether it is to lean out, build muscle, build strength, strength, stamina, Stamina, whatever your goal is, the thing you're not doing most often is probably the thing that's yeah, going to benefit I, your goal the most. I think this particular one really highlights the intention of how you structure your workout more than the rest. It's it's really one of those things that as a, a trainer trying to like uh, articulate this to clients because that was such a, a common theme was uh, I need to be doing something because you know I'm here I'm I'm working out yeah. like you know what else what else what else or even I've seen uh, some trainers apply uh, you know rubber bands in between uh, exercises, which, you know, active rest is, is what they call that, which is total garbage. But, um, you know, you need to allow your body to uh, go through that specific energy uh, uh, exchange and, and to, to make sure that the, the strength part of it is the focus of it, that we're, we're literally telling and program our, our body to uh, respond, you know, according to uh, what, that, what that demand looks like and how we're manipulating the, the central nervous system specifically and, and focusing on that. So yes, it's important. It's important to, to rest and then, you know, refocus and then apply that uh, very specific energy towards lifting the weight. So it's strength focused. Yeah. And it, we would, I would also get this comment. It's like, well, when I burn more calories, if I do stuff while I'm supposed to be resting <laughs> yeah. again, very small, this is a very, very short sighted uh, way of viewing exercise. Technically, would you burn more calories if you didn't do any rest within that workout? You would, does it make a difference in terms of fat loss? Yeah, it does in the negative. Uh, because again, you are not encouraging your metabolism to speed up the same. You're actually encouraging your metabolism to start to become more efficient. And this happens very quickly. Within a month, this will start to happen. If your goal is fat loss and it's long-term fat loss and it's easier fat loss, you want a faster metabolism. Forget the calories you burn during your workout. It's a complete waste of time to do that. That's not important unless you're doing it for like four weeks. Like within a four week period, yeah, it might make sense. After that, you start to adapt and then it starts to kind of become uh, negative. Now you brought up active rest, right? So people are like, well, I don't want to just sit here on the bench and rest. I want to do something. Okay. So if you're like super busy body, I have to do something, uh, you can stretch in between sets. Now this may be beneficial for muscle building. I don't recommend this if you're a performance athlete, static stretching may actually reduce uh, activation and may actually increase risk of injury. But if you're more into a bodybuilding workout, long stretches in between sets might actually help with muscle building. At the very least, it won't hurt. So if you're one of those people like, I got to do something, fine. You're working out your chest to right. hold the stretch <laughs> in between sets. So I want, I want to give a hack right now for the people that are, are consistently lifting a guaranteed way to break through your your training plateau that you potentially might have right now. So, and it's literally, and it's one of my favorite things to help somebody who's already been lifting, advanced lifter who comes to me and, and hires me to help them out. Do not change any of your exercise program, like whatever routine you're following, stick exactly to that. Literally manipulate your reps and your rest period. That's it. And pick, so go to your, your reps first, 
choose the the rep range. We gave you a rep range where to fall in between. Sal said it up to as high as 30. I think 20 is fine, but very few people go even above that. Most people don't even go to 20. So somewhere in that 5 to 20 range. I always like them to go to the, the most extreme opposite of where you're at. So unless you fall right in the middle of the 12 to 15 rep range, then either direction is fine. But if you're somebody who tends mm -hmm. to lift low reps all the time, go to the opposite of the spectrum, go to the, the high rep range, like the 20 rep range. If you're somebody who tends to go more 20 rep range, go to the low rep range. So choose that. So choose a rep range that is, uh, is vastly different than what you normally do. And then the same thing goes for rest periods. If you're somebody who tends to sit and get on your phone and give yourself long, you know, power lifter type of rest periods where they're three minutes and sometimes beyond, cut it down to 30 seconds to one minute. If you're the busy body, never sit still, super sec circuit type training person who rarely ever rests longer than 30 seconds to a minute, go the other extreme and go three minute resting. Do those two things. Don't change your exercises. Don't change anything about your Watch routine. Watch what happens. Mm -hmm. Watch how your body responds and stick to that for three yeah. to four weeks. I guarantee you break through a yeah. plot. Now here's one more thing too, is that Traditionally, uh, long rest periods are combined with low reps and heavy weight. And traditionally, mm -hmm. short rest periods are combined with high reps and lighter weight. And I know why, right? This makes sense, right? So if you're going low reps, heavy weight, the goal is to lift as much as possible. So it makes sense to have long rest periods. And if you're going light with higher reps, maybe your goal is to get a good pump. And so the goal, so it makes sense to have shorter rest periods because that also contributes to the pump. But is this a, a, a rule written in stone? No. Mm -mm. You could do high reps and have long rest periods. You could do low reps and have short rest periods. I do this all the time. i done this before with heavy squats where I, and by the way, I can't go as heavy because I'm not resting as long, mm -hmm. but I'm still training in the five rep range and I'll do 30 seconds in between sets or I'll do high reps oh. and do like a four minute rest in between sets. It's a wonderful combination. This is not a written in stone rule uh, mm -hmm. that because you, you do see that in workouts you typically see the heavyweight right. low reps with the long yeah. you can mix them up and it's 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 totally fine you get great results uh, you know doing that so there you have it uh, your sets reps and uh, what was the last rest periods there you go those three things very important manipulate them everything you need to know about those by the way if you like our information and you want more information on exercise nutrition even information for personal trainers head over to mind pump free Dot com. We got lots of free stuff for you. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.